My name is Professor John Deanfield, and it's a great pleasure to be here talking to you about primordial cardiology in youth. What are the limits? Now, these days, it's impossible to give a talk without starting with the COVID-19 pandemic, which has devastated the population in the world. But as we emerge from COVID, we now begin to realize how important background cardiovascular health is to not only our risk in the pandemic, but our future wellness as we emerge. And my talk today is going to be around the management of lifetime cardiovascular risk from early intervention and modification of cardiovascular risk factors. Now, even before COVID, there were some clues that things were not going well in terms of our understanding of prevention of cardiovascular disease. These are data from the UK looking at changes in life expectancy over the last 20 or so years. Every year, we expect to find that life expectancy in the population is going up from better medical care. But over the last five to 10 years, this trend has been reversed. So that we now face the possibility that the next generation will be the first to have a life expectancy that's shorter than the current generation. Now, why is this? Well, Alan Gregg, many years ago, was right when he suggested that the problem was exposure to modifiable risk factors due to behavioral change in society. The human race, he wrote, has had long experience and a fine tradition in surviving adversity. We're very good with wars and famines, but we now face a task for which we have little experience, the task of surviving prosperity. Now, this is going to result in a revolution in healthcare in the next few years. We really are at a disruptive moment in healthcare provision, with a shift from disease management to wellness maintenance. And that's going to affect all of us in our clinical practice and also in society. Currently, this estimate from KPMG, looking at the way in which we spend our money on healthcare, suggests that we spend around 70% of our budget treating disease, and 30% of our budget trying to prevent it. By 2040, this ratio will be reversed, with around 70% of our budget being spent on prevention and only 30% on treating established disease. So why is this happening now? Well, it's happening now because we begin to understand the opportunity we have from managing cardiovascular disease much earlier than our clinical practice. Cardiovascular disease, I'm going to show you, begins in the young due to earlier exposure to cardiovascular risk factors. Earlier management to reduce lifetime exposure to that cardiovascular risk leads to less atherosclerosis and fewer later cardiovascular events, something that I've called investing in your arteries. And if we're going to achieve the gains we would hope to get, prevention is going to require a national policy to empower the public from youth to understand their cardiovascular risk, but also their opportunities for lifetime benefit from early changes in cardiovascular risk profiles. So let's start with the change in our understanding of how cardiovascular disease develops in all of us. When we see atherosclerosis in our clinical practice, we're usually seeing patients who present with clinical events from 50 years and onwards. At that stage, their underlying atherosclerosis is extremely well developed and largely irreversible. We don't usually take account of that long preclinical period when potentially modifiable cardiovascular risk factors are driving the development of atherosclerosis in all of us. Now, the shift towards early intervention is a bit the, like the way in which we think about our financial planning. None of us will think that it's a good idea to start saving for our retirement when we're 64 years of age. We all appreciate that early investment with compound interest leads to future gains, and that's exactly how we should be thinking about the management of arterial disease. What is the evidence for the early onset of atherosclerosis? Well, for many years, we've had individual accounts of young people who died of non cardiac related diseases who already had surprising amounts of atherosclerosis. But more recently, we've had trials and evidence to show how often atherosclerosis can become established in early life. This is a study from Murat Tuju at the Cleveland Clinic, who looked at young Americans in the modern era who were dying of non cardiac related diseases, 
and whose hearts were being used as the donor hearts in the Cleveland Clinic transplant program. On the left, you see a 32-year-old woman from this study who died in a car accident near Cleveland. You see an intravascular ultrasound catheter in her coronary artery, which characterizes the atherosclerosis. And you see a very impressive atherosclerotic lesion already present in this asymptomatic young woman. Now we could speculate how many of us on this call already have arteries that look like this. Actually, you don't have to speculate too much because if you now look at the right-hand side of the slide, these are the results from almost 300 individuals dying of non-cardio-related causes at different ages. Almost one in five teenagers in this study already had early atherosclerosis. And very worryingly, when they looked at individuals who were over 50 at the time of death, almost 85% already had established atherosclerosis. So when we treat patients in clinical practice, we're missing the opportunity to modify the long preclinical period during which time atherosclerosis is developing and progressing in all of our arteries. Now, many years ago, Strasser in Switzerland coined the term primordial prevention. And what he meant by this term was that we should try to avoid risk factor exposure in societies, even before we start to manage preclinical disease. Actually, this is all coming together now because I've shown you how early atherosclerosis develops in relationship to these risk factors. So primordial and primary prevention are beginning to merge again together. Now, what evidence do we have that that exposure to risk factors during that long preclinical period of life relates to future cardiovascular outcome? Well, this is precisely the question that Donald Lloyd-Jones sought to address when he returned to the Framingham database and looked at the risk factor profile at the age of 50 in Framingham and its relationship to future cardiovascular outcomes. You can see that if you were a man in Framingham and you reached the age of 50 with all of your risk factors in optimal condition, the future risk of a cardiovascular event was very low, just 5%. On the other hand, if you were a man in Framingham who reached 50 with two or more of your major modifiable risk factors at above optimal levels, the risk rose to a whopping 69%. What this tells us is that exposure to risk factors in those first 50 years of life has a huge impact on future cardiovascular outcome. Now, the second key point is that we now have evidence that earlier management to reduce lifetime exposure to cardiovascular risk factors is able to lead to less atherosclerosis and fewer later cardiovascular events. This is the investing in your arteries concept of early intervention for future gain. Now, I would love to be able to show you a randomized clinical trial that proved that early lowering of risk factors resulted in fewer later clinical events. But of course, that sort of trial is never going to be feasible. But it's here that genetics have really helped us understand both the causal pathways to atherosclerosis and the opportunities from early intervention. This is a beautiful paper from Brian Ferenc and colleagues who looked at the UK biobank population and looked at the relationship between genes that affected cholesterol and blood pressure over the lifetime of individuals and future cardiovascular outcome. If you were born with a gene profile that was associated with a lower blood pressure over your whole life, you had an almost 20% lower risk of future cardiovascular events. Similarly, if you had a gene profile that was associated with a lower LDL cholesterol, you had an almost 30% reduction in future cardiovascular events. If you were lucky enough to be born with favorable risk factor profiles from your genes for blood pressure and for cholesterol, that benefit was almost 40%. Now, if you have a lower blood pressure of 10 millimeters over your lifetime and a lower cholesterol level of almost 40 millimeters over your lifetime, the benefit you gain in terms of future cardiovascular events is enormous. An almost 80% reduction in future cardiovascular events achieved with chronic exposure to levels of risk factors which are achievable by favorable lifestyles. What this tells us is that arterial disease tantalizingly 
may be actually preventable and we may be able to prevent or largely reduce the population incidence of heart attacks and strokes. When we talk to patients about risk factor intervention, we usually say that it's never too late to do something about it. What we're now suggesting that it's never too early. Now, how early should we be targeting modifiable cardiovascular risk factors in the population to achieve this gain? Well, sadly, in our current society, risk factors are beginning to emerge not in your 30s and 40s, but actually in the first and second decades of life. One of the key drivers of this is the worldwide epidemic of obesity, which happens already in childhood. And we can see some alarming statistics on this slide to show that children who are obese at the age of two have an 80% chance of being obese at the age of 35. Now, that early life obesity translates to an adverse cardiovascular risk in later life, as shown in this study. You see here the impact of BMI during adolescence on future cardiovascular mortality that begins to emerge after 30 and 40 years and is largely driven by the development of diabetes and hypertension. So there is an opportunity to target this early exposure to risk factors with substantial clinical gain. And this is nicely shown by a paper published from the Young Finn study in the New England Journal of Medicine that was able to demonstrate that the adverse effects of obesity in childhood disappeared in terms of future cardiovascular risk if you were able to achieve a normal level of weight after the first and second decade of life. So this is a potentially modifiable situation that will result in future cardiovascular gain. Now, interestingly, it's not just cardiovascular disease that will benefit from early exposure to risk factors like obesity, cholesterol, stress, blood pressure, and smoking. Multiple other diseases are also associated with these same risk factor patterns. If we are obese and have a high cholesterol, a hypertension, or smoke, not only do we increase our risk of cardiovascular disease and stroke, but also diabetes, cancer, atrial fibrillation, and even dementia. And the reason for this is they've come through common pathways for disease, which are largely driven by systemic inflammation and oxidative stress. So there is added gain from early life risk factor modification, not just for cardiovascular disease, but hopefully to delay or even prevent these other diseases as well. This was nicely shown by another study from the Young Finn study that looked at teenage risk levels of cardiovascular risk factors and their relationship to cognitive function in middle age. What's good for the heart is good for the brain, we begin to understand. And you can see here how teenage levels of risk factors were strongly associated with cognitive function in, midlife, in the midlife period. This is further evidence that early intervention can translate to substantial clinical benefit for the population on multiple diseases of aging. So if we buy into the idea of early intervention for future gain, prevention strategies are going to require a national policy to empower the public from youth, not only to understand their cardiovascular risk, but also their opportunity for lifetime benefit. We've got a long way to go to convince the public that cardiovascular disease is important to them. This slide shows you what Americans are searching for in terms of their health on Google. In the left-hand panel, you see the causes of death in the United States in 2016. And you can see at the top of the tree is still heart disease, 30.2%. The second column, though, shows you what Americans are searching for when they think about their health and look for health solutions. They're still worried about cancer, they're worried about other factors like suicide, diabetes, dementia and the like. But look how little attention they're playing to the possibility of heart disease being important for them, just 2.5% of the searches. Now, media coverage doesn't help that at all. The third column shows you media coverage on health in the New York Times in that same year. Dominated by terrorism, homicide, suicide, a little bit about cancer, but almost nothing about heart disease. Now, in case you think this is an American problem, the last column, column shows you media coverage in a UK newspaper, The Guardian, over that same period. 
almost identical to the coverage in the New York Times. So we've done a very bad job of convincing the public that modifying heart disease risk is important to their future health. We've tended to lecture individuals about short-term risk, but not given them the opportunity to understand the relationship between their risk factor profile and the benefit that they would get from modifying risk factors earlier. These are the sort of things we use to communicate risk to our patients and to the public. We talk about absolute 10-year cardiovascular risk in our guidelines, and you see the familiar tables on the left here. These are tables relating blood pressure, cholesterol to age in men and women. And notice that you can be 55 as a woman, have a blood pressure of 180 and a cholesterol of 8 and still have a low short-term risk. On the other hand, if you're a man over the age of 65, it doesn't really matter what your blood pressure and cholesterol are, you're at high absolute short-term risk because you're male and because you're elderly. What this is doing is disenfranchising the young, and especially women, from getting effective lifetime cardiovascular prevention advice. And these short-term metrics are inappropriate for a prevention strategy and prevention communica benefit communication. So a few years ago, we developed an innovative calculator in the UK called the JBS3, or Joint British Societies Calculator. What this did was to estimate not just short-term risk, but also lifetime risk, and start to communicate it to the public in terms of metrics that we thought they could more easily understand. We talked about patients or an individual's heart age. We also showed them their time to first cardiovascular event and what they could do by modifying their cardiovascular risk factors to reduce their heart age and to delay their first heart attack or stroke. This is the approach that is now going to really underpin future cardiovascular risk prevention strategies. We've moved from calculators that tried to do this using observational effects to demonstrate benefit, which were very disappointing, towards the JBS3 approach that used randomized clinical trials to demonstrate the benefit to patients, but now to an understanding based on causal pathways and cumulative effects, as we've seen from Mendelian randomization studies, that really show us the huge gains that we get from early intervention, which is sustained over individuals' lifetime. Now, we're in the era of personalized preventative medicine, and we're nowhere near the limits that we can achieve to focus down on an individual's risk and the benefits that they can obtain. Those effects on modifiable risk factors are going to be supplemented by new understanding based on imaging, biomarkers, and genetics to drive our understanding of personalized risk prediction and intervention. Familial hypercholesterolemia is the paradigm for a genetic cause of future risk and for the benefits from early intervention for lifetime benefit. We all know that there are individuals in the population who have a monogenic disorder like familial hypercholesterolemia, which drives premature cardiovascular disease. And we now have very strong evidence from studies like this one published recently in the New England Journal of Medicine that if we're able to identify those individuals and modify their risk factors early in a sustainable way, we can reverse that adverse impact on cardiovascular outcomes. You can see in this study how children with familial hypercholesterolemia from parents with the same disease and the same genetic profile have a substantially beneficial effect from early intervention using treatments like statins. Now, most of us don't have a monogenic disorder that increases our personal future cardiovascular risk, but we all have multiple genes that affect our risk factor levels and our future cardiovascular outcome. So this concept of calculating a gene-wide polygenic score for common diseases and using that to help us with our understanding of future risk and strategizing intervention is gaining importance. This was a study from UK Biobank again, which constructed genome-wide polygenic risk force for multiple diseases, including coronary disease. If you take the top three or four percent of those risk factor profiles, you can identify individuals who are at substantially increased risk of that individual disease, like coronary disease. 
And in fact, for coronary disease, the prevalence of high polygenic risk is around 20 times higher in the population than the carrier rate for monogenic disorders like familial hypercholesterolemia. So this is an unmet opportunity to understand how genetics prime us for future different diseases, including cardiovascular disease. Of course, this risk stratification based on polygenic risk scores is going to be important, but must be considered in terms of the level of modifiable risk factors those individuals also have. You can see, for example, the trajectories to coronary disease associated with the lowest polygenic risk score profile compared to the highest, and you can see how this does help us stratify individuals in terms of trajectory to disease. But notice when we look at the middle polygenic risk factor, risk score quintile, how important modifiable risk factors like LDL and cholesterol are in determining what happens to that individual. Massive differences in outcome related to even small changes in LDL cholesterol and blood pressure, which are of course are modifiable where genetic risk scores are not. So lots happening in this space of personalizing prediction. And we as a medical profession are going to have to change our role in the future. We have to move away from just being concerned with treatment of established disease to getting involved much more in personalized prevention of future cardiovascular diseases. We also have to be advocates for our population, for our healthcare providers and with the politicians for societal change that's going to enable the delivery of population level benefits in terms of risk factor modification. The good news is that our politicians now really understand the imperative for this and are working together with us as a medical profession to have this disruptive change in thinking about prevention. This is Matt Hancock, our health secretary, who two or so years ago said, if we get prevention right, it holds the key to longer, healthier, happier lives. Each year we spend £97 billion of public money in the UK on treating disease and only £8 billion in preventing it. We must get smarter about where we spend our money because preventative treatments cost less than retrograde treatments further down the line. And this is going to be an important shift in the way in which healthcare resources are allocated towards disease management. So in conclusion, we really are at a disruptive moment in healthcare, particularly for the management of cardiovascular disease. A much greater emphasis on cardiovascular disease prevention, which is just beginning as we move from the disease care system to embracing wellness maintenance. This is going to involve a change in approach from us as doctors, but also politicians, public funders, and private healthcare insurers as well. We need to challenge the public and develop a partnership with them and with our patients to provide the best and affordable care, which actually allows us to target risk factors and behavioral change to alter lifestyles long before disease emerges. If we're able to do that, we'll get close to the um, very perceptive comment that Ernest Winder, a GP, made some years ago that it should be the function of medicine to have people die young as late as possible. Thank you for your attention. <music>